Today on the show... We connect the dots with IMDb's top 10 stars of 2017. Paul Shear has regrets. I regret a lot of the things I said here today. I, I'm going to be honest. And I throw a bunch of holiday cheer in your face. I will stuff up the tree. This is the IMDb Show. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Tim Cash. I'm Carrie Doherty. It's Friday, December 8th, which means only six more days until we're off again to a galaxy far, far, far away, Star Wars ref. Yes, super excited. Are you counting down the days on your calendar? Yes, every single day my tickets are already booked. Oh, good for you. Yeah. I like that. Organization. That's responsible. Well, we at IMDb actually caught up with Daisy Ridley to learn a little bit more about the latest installment. Show me my place in all this. It's really cool for a character to sort of be going through something on the audience totally with them, that I get to explore things that a lot of the time films don't have time for or don't concentrate so much on. So it was more the emotional thing of her sort of figuring out her identity. <laughs> that, that's what I want to see from the new Star Wars, intensity. Super intense. You know that scene where he reached out with his hand? Yeah. I don't actually think that those two scenes are paired together in the movie. Really? It's kind of my suspicion. I think it's some misdirect going on. Ooh. Ooh, fun fan theory. Uh -huh. Oh man, well, we will just have to wait like everybody else. But in the meantime, it's time for your IMD Brief. This week, we celebrated the year's most beloved actors and actresses with the annual Top 10 Stars list. The list is made up of the 10 people who have consistently ranked highest on IMDb Pro's star meter chart throughout the year. And today, we're going to break down and connect the top three. At number three on the list is the mother of dragons herself, Amelia Clarke, who's best known for her work as Daenerys Targaryen on what I think is the best show on television, Game of Thrones, a role that shot her to stardom in 2011. My reign has just begun. But before her time in the limelight and movies such as Terminator Genesis, the excellent Dom Hemingway, and the upcoming Han Solo spin-off entitled Solo, A Star Wars Story, Amelia honed her acting skills at the Drama Center London. This famed acting school boasts Colin Firth, Pierce Brosnan, and Michael Fassbender as alumni, as well as our number two on the list, Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy's currently hard at work filming the adaptation of Marvel Comics' eagerly anticipated Venom. But this won't be the first time Hardy has played in the superhero universe. In 2012, he starred in The Dark Knight Rises as the memorable supervillain Bane. Tomorrow you claim what is rightfully yours. Another star who recently shared the screen with the Cape Crusader, but this time Affleck's Batman in Justice League, is our number one title holder, Wonder Woman, Gal Gadot. Ever since Gal Gadot won herself the role of Wonder Woman, beating out some of Hollywood's A-list, it's been non-stop work for the Israeli-born actress. And it doesn't look like it's slowing down anytime soon, with Justice League Part 2, Wonder Woman 2, and the upcoming Flash movie Flashpoint already announced. Stay here, I'll go ahead. And just to bring this list full circle, because we can, Gadot's Justice League co-star Jason Momoa played the son to Amelia Clark's moon in season one of Game of Thrones as Khal Drago. And there you have it. A crown for king. If you're curious to see who else made it on IMDb's top 10 stars of 2017 and want to make some connections of your own, check it out at the link below. It's that time of year again when we're putting down our phones and picking up our TV remotes in anticipation of watching animated holiday TV specials. From baby boomers to post-millennials, these original classics are ingrained in our DNA with their memorable songs, stories, and characters. Like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, which introduced me to stop-motion animation and taught us all to embrace our inner misfit. Have a holly jolly Christmas. It's the best time of the year. And I can't mention misfits without including Charlie Brown. I mean, a kid who owns his flaws and boldly rejects holiday materialism? The rest of those peanuts were lucky to have him around. Linus is right. I won't let all this commercialism ruin my Christmas. 34 years before Jim Carrey donned a green suit to play the Grinch, Boris Karloff narrated the animated one in the original and classic How the Grinch Stole Christmas. You nauseate me. Mr. Grinch. And what would a winter holiday be without a sentient snow being who magically appears one day in White Plains, New York? Frosty the snowman knew the sun was hot that day. Now, just because these TV special classics have been around for 50 odd years doesn't mean new ones can't make the list. So what does it take to make it on the list of holiday classics? Well, first there has to be catchy wintry wonderland music. Just sing. 
A Christmas song. That's it. Second, there has to be a heartfelt lesson learned. You can't make someone believe, Chippy. All you can do is be there. And most importantly, it must include an adorably voiced child. A Mecca baby's gonna do what a Mecca baby's gonna do. Come in. The more the merrier. The more the merrier. Let us know what your favorite animated holiday special is on Twitter. At IMDB, hashtag IMDB show. Today's guest is an actor, comedian, writer, producer, director, podcaster, and clearly an overachiever. Whether it's his work on The League, Veep, or his latest movie, The Disaster Artist, you can always count on him to bring the funny Paul Shear. You embarrass that girl in front of the entire whoa, whoa, group, hey, hey, you're a dead man. Oh, really? Hey, hey, hey. Oh, really? I'm yeah. dead man? I'm dead man? I'm so busy. I'm so busy. We're so grateful to have you here. Um, and also a movie out today. Yes, uh, I'm really excited about The Disaster Artist. I've seen it already, yeah. and it was great. Like, was so really, really good. I think for- Wait, you just said great, and then you were like, really, really good. So I feel like you just walked it back a little I bit. I just didn't want to kiss up to you so early on in the interview. Um, this is a movie about yes. a movie. Yes. The Room is this movie. It was made by this guy, Tommy Wiseau, a questionable origin. No one really knows where he's from, where he got his money. I cannot tell you. It's confidential. And this movie has kind of grown <laughs> in this kind of cult status. And this guy, Greg Sestero, who was one of the actors in the film, wrote a book about his experiences with Tommy. That book became The Disaster Artist. Can you do that voice? You know, I think the thing that I love is the laugh, where he's like, ha, 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 Yes. And everyone was doing it on set, so it was this competition to be the best Tommy. Do you have to see The Room before Disaster Artist? The way I kind of see it is like this. If you've never seen The Room, I think you will fully enjoy it. If you've seen The Room, this is the best prequel you'll ever get for it. The question is, we're still talking about The Room now. Yes. How many years afterwards? Do you think people will still talk about The Disaster Artist? And if not, then which is a better movie? Oh, I firmly believe The Room will outlive The Disaster Artist because there is nothing else like The Room. You know, when they say like good, bad movies, I don't believe in that. Like it's so bad, it's good. Believe me, I've been in a couple of bad movies. Meet Dave if you haven't seen uh, that. No, but uh, like, uh, like a movie like Piranha 3 Double D. Don't look it up. They'll find you, they'll always find you. Bring me my legs. It's not a pretty sight, it's not a pretty sight. Well, we got to catch up with James Franco at the Disaster Artist Junket to find out which one bad movie yes. he would have loved to be in. There's this movie that I keep bringing up that Paul Shear turned me on to called Miami Connection. It is so weird and fun, but it was it's like a 12-year-old boy's idea of everything cool. Oh, he robbed you. He took my answer. Now you got to think on your feet. What would be one bad movie that you would love to be in? I'm gonna go and say Jim Cotta, a action movie based off gymnastics. His title, three-time world gymnastics champion. His assignment, a secret mission for the United States government. <laughs> All right, we'd love a piece of trivia from you about the film The Disaster Artist for the IMDb page. Okay, and this movie has amazing cameos. Huge but cameos. a few people were left on the cutting room floor. Who? Jim Parsons, Kate Upton, Eliza Coop, and Zach Braff all shot scenes that just did not figure into the narrative that finally got sculpted down for the film. So I can't have you here and be a true Star Wars fan without asking how you're feeling about this new movie coming out next week. I am so excited. My tickets are bought. I'm ready to go. So what are you hoping to see in Last Jedi? I love Ryan Johnson. Whatever he does, I just want to be surprised. I feel like there's been such a small amount of leaks on this film that that actually yeah. even makes me more excited. What is your geekiest Star Wars moment? Oh my gosh, you know, I paid to go see Meet Joe Black because the Phantom Menace trailer was playing before it. And I sat through Meet Joe Black because they were playing it at the end of it. Meet Joe Black is not that bad. Have you seen it recently? I thoroughly enjoyed this peanut butter. Maybe it was just the Star Wars fan of me. It was like, I don't care. I want to see more of this. You're writing the new Galaxy Quest for Amazon. Yeah. What can we expect? To me, the dumbest thing you could do is be like, they're back in space. So I want to do a thing with two different casts, a brand new Galaxy Quest cast, kind of in the vein of a J.J. Abrams reboot of Star Trek, and continue the story of our old cast, but literally continue it, not just redo it. We are actors, not astronauts. You are our protectors. You know, for me, the biggest challenge is creating something that's uniquely 
new, that I'm proud of, that also uh, the fans will love and will bring in new fans. As you're writing Galaxy Quest yes. in the future, your lines may be used in this the oh my gosh. speed round. It's a big thing. I'm gonna read you a classic line from a TV or movie and you're gonna fill in the blank, but with your own word or phrase. Oh my right. gosh, all right. Ready? Yes. Love means never having to say, I'm sorry I didn't flush the toilet. Your poor wife. <laughs> My mama always said life is like a really gaudy shirt because last year for Christmas, she got me a shirt which is like a screen print of Casablanca. Cause she's like, you like movies? It's a movie shirt. She sounds awesome. <laughs> One from Galaxy Quest by Grabthar's Hammer. I will write the best version of this script <laughs> that I could possibly write. Paul, stick around just for a bit. We're gonna have fan questions for you in just a moment. But first, Kerry headed out to see why The Room is the perfect midnight movie. If you're planning on seeing The Disaster Artist this weekend, you should definitely check out the movie within the movie, Tommy Wiseau's 2003 bizarro masterpiece, The Room, which gained cult status after being shown at midnight movie screenings here in Los Angeles at theaters just like this. I recently sat down with a few experts to talk about midnight movie culture and how The Room found success within it. You are tearing me apart, Lisa! Bernie, you are a connoisseur, an expert on the midnight movie. Tell me everything I need to know. So midnight movies have a really rich history and tradition. It, it really probably started with Pink Flamingos. Mm -hmm. <gasps> Thank you, hating. How repellent. And then Rocky Horror, like the queen of the midnight movie, exploded it onto the scene and I mean that took it to a whole different level with the live show shadow casting and things like yeah. that. Why don't you stay for the night? What do you think it is about the room that makes it the perfect midnight movie. That one sprang up so organically. It's culty, it's a little weird. Even some of the dialogue pausing, the similar to Rocky Horror where there's so much room for you to take it and run with it. Mm -hmm. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. Tommy Wiseau may be the man responsible for making The Room, but it may not have reached its full audience potential without the man who originally discovered it back in 2003, Michael Rousselet. I saw a trailer for The Room in 2003. It was the most overly dramatic, bombastic trailer I've ever seen, and it told me nothing. And then I saw it on the marquee at the Fallbrook Lemley as I was just driving by. We walked up to the box office, and she pointed to a sign that said, there will be no refunds for The Room after the first 15 minutes. And we're like, hmm, tempting. No one else was in the theater, so we, had, we were able to run amok. We were just laughing and screaming, and like, what is going on? Before the film was even over, uh, I was on the phone calling my friend saying, you have to see this movie. And then we all said, we're gonna come back the next day, and we brought more people, so we had like 30 people. And then on the final night, when we knew it was gonna be gone, uh, we brought 100 people. But the room wasn't gone. People kept talking about it, and even celebrities like Paul Rudd and Kristen Bell started hosting viewing parties, propelling the room to the popular midnight movie that it is today. So if you and your friends hit up a midnight screening of the room, don't forget to maximize the fun by wearing your finest tuxedos and tossing a football around like totally normal human beings. That's it, I'm done. Okay. Great idea, Danny. Uh, fun fact, guys, Michael Rousselet is actually in The Disaster Artist. I'm not where? gonna tell you where. It's an Easter egg, he's like a spoon. Mm. Find him. There's one thing you have to do, do you see The Disaster Artist? Stay until the very end of the yes. credits. There's like a Marvel-esque like, post-credit scene that is worth your time, and I know that there's like two of them. There's like one, and then stay till the very, very end, and you'll, you'll have a treat. What kind of drugs do you take? So Paul, yes. we reached out on Twitter to get some fan questions mm. for you. This is a uh, how did this get made specific question. Okay. From at pre a kill, have you guys ever had a situation where you wanted to do a movie but one of you genuinely thought it was good? Oh yeah, that actually happens a lot. You know, on our show we try to find the best or most fun to talk about bad films. We've been recommended so many times to do this movie, Drop Dead Fred. Yeah. Um, and June loves Drop Dead Fred. Rick She's like, Mile. it's great. It's, it's amazing. All right, yes. so you guys I'm both. With June. All right, then then is off the table. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to be sick all over you immediately. Lie down. I have another one. At Citizen Spank, what does James Franco smell like? I gotta say, James Franco does not let you down in the smell department. Really? I'm gonna say sandalwood. You wanna be around him. He's like a, a wonderful candle that's not overpowering, but you know it's there. <laughs> so Paul, at the end yes. of every episode, we all go over our watch list. Basically, yes. what we're watching that we think everybody else out there should be watching. Mm -hmm. What are you watching right now? You know, I think the show that I've been telling people to catch up on 
is the good place. Uh, Kristen Bell wakes up and she is in heaven. And that's all I'm gonna tell you because cool. where it goes from there is so off the rails. Holy mother forking shirt balls. What are you gonna be watching this weekend? I am in the middle of Search Party season two right oh, now. So good. Every episode, my mind just gets more blown away by that show. You know, Alia Shawkat, John Early makes me laugh so hard. How can this pile be so big and this hole can be so small? Tim, what about you? What are you watching? This weekend, uh, I, Tonya comes out. I love watching Margot Robbie. I just think she's a phenomenal actress. And also, this is one of those stories that, you know, should be fictional, but it's not. I don't have a wholesome American family. And if you want to watch any of the shows or movies that we've talked about in today's episode, Search Party, I, Tonya, The Disaster Artist, you can just add them to your IMDb watch list. Mm. If you don't have one, it's super easy to make. Look up a movie you're interested in, click the plus sign, and boom, it's added. Then the next time you don't know what to watch, open your watch list. Poor shit. Listen, thank you so much for being here on the show. It's been a real pleasure. I love being here. The show is great. Thank you for having and me. And congrats. Disaster Artist is out today. Yes. Everyone go see it. So stop what you're doing right now because the show's over and go see this movie. And you guys, please come back next Friday. But before we go, with so many trailers coming out each week, we want to help you guys stay on top of it all. So here are the best moments from this week's trailers. We're not taking you to court. We're just taking your money. I'll be with you to the end. It's the worst fake crying I've ever seen. She's just using the technique. 